Welcome to podcast number one, hot take of the day, coming to you live from World Broadcasting Headquarters in the basement of DRW's house where it all began. I'm here with my producer, Glenn Parrott. Glenn, how are you doing today? Happy New Year. I'm excited about this, David. I'm doing really well, so happy 2020. This is going to be fun. It's a long time coming. Uh, 2019 was a great year for the hot takers out there on LinkedIn. With Glenn's help, uh, producer, he's he's the man that's pulling this all together. Uh, we've moved to the web. We got www.hottakeoftheday.com, where there's a lot of archives. We're putting the podcast. We have links to the book. A lot of exciting things are coming in 2020. So. Um, we're really excited to be here. I want to tell you a little bit about the studio. This is a story I don't think, Glenn, I don't think you know it. But uh, I opened this studio when I was at One Energy Partners. We all worked from home, kind of had a video um, video conference office, no paper. It was very tech, and, and people who know me know how tech I am. So we opened the office, and, and you, you don't see it, but I'll probably post a picture of this. Um, there's a very large, what would you say, the, what would you describe the carpet in here as? Shag. Shag. There's a very large white shag carpet and just a couch in the middle of the room. And uh, I had done some renovations in the basement to make world headquarters look like this. It's a bit like an art gallery. So I was very excited because I used to do, I mean, I'm a caffeinated guy. But when we didn't have an office and we were getting ready to drill in 2017, I was having about seven or eight coffees a day. Um, with vendors at Starbucks. One of the reasons Starbucks is in the shit I use index, which we'll talk about. But nonetheless, I was very caffeinated. We built the office, and the first person I had come to the office, I I was a little bit, I don't always consider other people's feelings when I do things. So a saleswoman um, said, hey, can we meet and talk about this, this particular thing? And I said, sure, why don't you come by the office? And I give her a residential address, and uh, <laughs> and she ends up coming down the side stairs, which is even creepier, and then comes into the office where there's only a couch sitting on a shag carpet. And I didn't really think about how negatively perceived that could have been. <laughs> yeah, because this is a classic shag carpet. Like classic <laughs> shag carpet. But to me, I was very proud to show off World Headquarters. Um, to her, I think she probably had like, 911 on speed dial. So anyway, that is where we're broadcasting from. We're very excited to be here. And uh, the show today, we're going to talk a little bit about 2020. What, what, Glenn, what did you think about 2019 as you think about energy and, and reflection? It uh, was a, bit, a little bit um, uh, a way of the oil and gas industry trying to find its path forward. Um, you know, you're starting to see some, some movement onto uh, M&A, but, um, you know, and that's, those are all the things that you've already written about to be honest. So, and I'd like to hear more. So great. Well, I mean, I think in order for us to talk about 2020, I think we really need to look at the past decade. And so as I think about the past decade, a lot of people want to lump it in and say, well, in the last 10 years, energy has been the worst performing. So the best performing uh, stocks over the last 10 years were information technology. They were up 402% um, as opposed to energy, which was up 38.7%, which to be honest, if you'd bought in about 2012, uh, you could have bought T-bills, put them under your mattress, and you would have done better than if you'd owned energy stocks. And, and, and people, I think, like to bin everything in energy to the last 10 years. But I think it was a tale of two decades, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm reflecting on 2010. And 2010 to 2014, and we have this in the show notes. Um, you can go onto the website and, and check those out. But uh, the pricing average from 2010 to 2014 was about $90 a share or $90 a barrel. And uh, I remember running price decks on a whole bunch of acquisitions in about 2012, 2013 when I went off on my own. And uh, our price deck was 90 and 425 flat forever, which is kind of kind of amazing to think about when you think about the fact that right now we're sitting at 60 and last year's average was about 55. Um, but anyway, if you think about what happened in 2010 through 2014, oil average $90 a barrel. We were coming out of the financial crisis in 2008 interest rates were effectively zero and there were no other businesses that were making any money. Uh, There was no way for banks to get fees by making loans. And at the same time, really in 2008 and 2009, the Bakken and Eagleford go horizontal and companies start fracking in in big ways and we end up growing production. So you have this, this existence of a place where nobody can put money that works except for energy. 
in a new resource play that's just been discovered that is extremely capitally intensive. And between 2010 and 2014, not a lot of companies had resource plays. And so private equity was ahead of the curve by about nine months, built a whole bunch of positions that they sold to publicly traded companies. And uh, they ended up levering up the balance sheets so that by September of 2014, the world was amazing. Oil had been as high as 110 bucks. Bakken was blowing and going. Eagleford was blowing and going. Natural gas was still in the doldrums, but nobody cared. It was all about oil. And, you know, the energy industry was the place to be. And then OPEC happened. You remember You remember September 2014, Glenn? Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, and, that, you know, it was one of those strange things things that you know you started to see you know the supply demand uh, invert around may or so and then august comes along and uh, it's not getting better uh, and then of course by the end of the quarter the thanksgiving day surprise um is really uh, i wouldn't say the tipping point but certainly the accelerator yeah so so what walk us through the thanksgiving day surprise because i think uh i think some of our listeners might not remember that they might be too young they might be too old even to remember, and, and we're just coming off of New Year's. They might have had a big January 1st. No, that was just when OPEC decided, and you know this, OPEC decided to launch its uh, war for market share. Yeah. So so the Thanksgiving Day surprise really, I think, buffets the, the first half of the decade with the second half of the decade. And what you have is a tremendous number of energy companies that have massively levered balance sheets that were built on assets that worked at $100 a barrel. And even though we're five years on, I think a lot of people forget that this industry and shale in particular, a lot of the assets that companies have was predicated on 90 or $100 a barrel oil. And they use debt to buy them. And so as the second half of the decade comes through and as, as we have the low commodity prices of 2015 and 16 that, that kind of rebounded but have generally averaged sort of 50 to 55 for the last five years, companies have had to adapt to this new low price environment. But you've, you've seen me write it before and, and I'll talk about it here. I don't think of this as a, as a crisis of low commodity prices. I think of this as a crisis of balance sheets. And that's why it was so important to start in 2008 when you tell the energy story of the decade is because if, if companies hadn't levered up their balance sheets at two or three times debt to EBITDA at a $100 price deck, that leverage that has to be paid back you know, is going to come back and bite companies. And, and so I think 2019 saw some of it. But 2020 through 2023, there was an article that came out by Rystad, um, the research company that is probably one of the more bullish shale growth companies uh, or shale projectors that, that I know of. I think they're wrong. But in this particular case, they're statistically correct because it's data. There's about $40 billion of debt coming due in the next three to four years. Right. And uh, a lot of that's coming due in 2020. Uh, I think the, the projection of the top 40 shale producers is $11 billion is going to come due next year. Wow. So, so when we talk about the crisis of balance sheets, everyone knows our industry has zero access to capital in terms of new equity. And the banks have been changing their price decks. They've been asking for their money back. So even though oil is sitting at $60, the reason I feel so bullish on oil price but not on oil companies is because every single free cash flow dollar between 55 and let's say the price average is 62 or 63 this year, banks want their money back. And that $11 billion next year and the $13 billion the year after and the $18 billion in 2022 that's coming due, you can't raise equity to go pay down debt. Right. So there, there are really no options. And so because of that, I think we're in a crisis of balance sheets, not in a crisis of low commodity prices. And that's the backdrop for how everything's going to come in the next 10 years. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask, how would you compare the current balance sheet perspective now versus September of 2014? You know, I, it's, it's a great question. And, and I remember I remember September 2014. And... Uh, at the time, I had been working in private equity for about two and a half years, putting deals together, putting companies together. Um, and, and I remembered very distinctly because oil was sitting about $95 a barrel. I did, public companies could put so much money to work using equity and pay any price in terms of, you know, use your metric dollar per acre, dollar per stick, dollar per PDP. 
MLP market was still was still ripe. You had Lynn Energy would just buy every asset that was known to man as an example in that whole space. And so, you know, 20, 2014, just the, the mentality I had was you have to be a publicly traded company to have access to lower cost of capital through equity. And interestingly, anyone who bought shares in 2014 and held energy shares since 2014 has got absolutely crushed. And so we talk about cost of capital, but in fact, energy companies have had a negative cost of capital because their shares have been falling 10, 20% a year. And that's why our returns have been so poor. And that at the core is why we can't raise equity for a business that was built for a different price deck. And I think the difference in 2019 is people have realized this isn't a, a uh, uh, a downturn, like a secular or a cyclical downturn. I think it's a secular one. And I talk a lot about comparing our industry to coal. And, and I say, say that coal is 27% of the electricity produced in the United States. It still comes from coal in spite of the fact that there's only about eight publicly traded companies that produce coal. And so when I think 2014 versus 2019, there was a huge proliferation of companies trying to spend as much money as they possibly could to drill into this environment. And in 2019 now, we've seen that oil is probably 50 to 60 or 55 to 65 for the foreseeable future. We've done everything we can with technology. Every acre of land that's worth owning, I think, is already owned. And so now it's just exploit, drill, drill your returns and go away. And you don't need that many companies. And so banks need their money back. Companies need to consolidate. Companies need to shrink. And production needs to stay flat. So that, that's, I think, differentially how I think about 2019 versus 14. So moving forward, what about 2020? 2020. Um, yeah, so I did a post uh, December 31st. You can look it up on the website uh, that sort of talked about 2020 expectations. And, and today we'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper in. One of my favorite topics to always talk about is mergers and equity acquisitions. I think when I go back to the beginning of 2019, I talked a lot about uh, my expectations that we would see a lot of share deals and equity deals. And I would say broadly speaking, we probably didn't see as many as, as I thought we would. Um, obviously, we're going to talk about Oxy, my, my crush, my, my, uh, my CEO crush, Vicky Holub. I know that that's controversial, but we're going to spend some time on, on the Oxy merger. But I think the Oxy merger was interesting because most people saw Chevron's bid for Anadarko as opening the floodgates for mergers and acquisitions coming this year. And I think with the way that drama played out and ultimately Oxy winning and, and shareholders feeling like, you know, they had their, their opportunity to, to weigh in bypassed, um, I think the negativity around that really scared management teams. On top of that, you know, as we went through the summer and as prices sort of fell off, we saw equities continue to fall dramatically from April to July. So I obviously worked at Anadarko and have a lot of friends who are who are still Anadarko or were Anadarko. And I make the joke that, look, if they hadn't sold to Oxy, Anadarko is probably a $30 stock right now. And Oxy probably isn't that far away from a $40 stock right now because everyone traded off so much after that. And so a lot of people focus on the stock price of Oxy as evidence that that deal wasn't a good deal. I think we need to watch it over the next two years really to, to get a feel. But but guys just got crushed all the way through the summer. And it's really hard if your shares used to be $12 a share, now they're $5 a share, to go to your shareholders and say, hey, I want to do a zero premium deal with someone. And um, you've just lost 60%. We're going to lock that in. Doesn't that sound good? So I think that's really what we saw through the last six months of last year. And then as we move into 2020, I now believe that mergers and equity acquisitions are going to happen at a much, much higher pace. Yeah, I think that, you know, there was an expectation in 2019 that they expected in a challenging environment more M&A than what occurred. Yeah. And you talk about don't do M&A just for the sake of it, but make it smart. Yeah. So I think, I mean, as we talk about the projections for 2020, I want to talk about three deals from 2019 that I think have been misinterpreted, at least in my view, that that if the right impression of these deals comes out over the next couple months, com- companies will be able to more aggressively chase the deal. So we're going to talk Oxy and APC. We're going to talk Callan and Carrizo. I will say I am a shareholder in Callan now. Uh, I did buy their shares after uh, they closed the deal, and I'll explain that. But I am not a fan of the Callan Carrizo deal from when they announced it. 
So let's talk about why that deal was was so, in my opinion, bad. Is that fair? Bad? Why was it bad? So Callan was a pure play Permian producer with Midland Basin assets and Delaware Basin assets that was trading about $2 billion market cap. A little bit high leverage, but then nice assets, they were pure play. And and companies who wanted to consolidate, that was a perfect morsel that a $10 billion, $12 billion, $15 billion independent could have taken, could have paid a premium for, and it would have been accretive. They would have cut GNA, they would have been able to pay down debt and get better access to capital. And so Callan was an acquisition candidate. And when they came out and bought Carrizo, the challenge with Carrizo was twofold. Number one, they were multi-basin. So, they, I mean, they still are multi-basin, but now Callan is multi-basin. Right. Uh, post-close, I think they closed December 20th after they delayed the, the vote. And, and rightfully so. There was, a lot of, there was a lot of issues with the way that deal came through. But as I see it, you know, Carrizo has this Eagleford assets that, that's legacy and has this Permian position that, that kind of dovetails with Callan, but it wasn't a great fit. And so for Callan themselves to be an acquirer of Carrizo didn't make a lot of sense. And I think the investor community saw that didn't make a lot of sense. That looked like a management team just trying to hang on to their jobs and hang on to their high cost, uh, high salaries. And to me, when people use Callan Carrizo as an example of why M&A is hard, I think that's just because that was a bad deal. Mm. Now, I did say, and I preface this, um, I am a shareholder in Callan, and I'll tell you why. Uh, and we're, we'll, we'll come back to this, shit, this in, in a later episode. But there's something called smog, which is the standardized measure of oil and gas. I, I write about it a lot on the post, but, but now that I have a microphone, I can talk a little bit more about it. So the smog is a end-of-year number that's put in every annual report. It uses a flat price deck from the SEC. The SEC limits PUD development to a five-year time period, and it runs out the PDP. And so when you look at the smog of a company like Callan and Carrizo, their, their shares are actually trading below their smog value. And they're one of the very few companies that exist that trade at a less than 100% of their smog. I think as of today, they're trading at something like 80% of their smog. And Carrizo was trading at 65 And so, you know, yes, can we talk about reservoir engineering? Yes, we're going to have a a, a great guy that I've known for a long time on the show to talk about exactly this reservoir engineering, SEC reserves, and what it means later in January. But, you know, yes, can you project that maybe some reserve write-offs are coming? Maybe. But relatively speaking, everyone's SEC reserves are about the same. And so when you run a uh, standardized measure over a five-year development plan and you find that their shares are trading less than 100%, when their peers are trading 150%, 190%, 250%. To me, they seem like a good value buy. And if you're bullish on oil, which I am, and we'll talk about later in the show, that's why I own Callan. This is not investment advice. Don't go out and take any advice that I say, but I feel like I should tell you that I am talking my book a little bit. I am long Callan. That is why I'm long Callan. But I still hate the deal. They shouldn't have done the deal. But now that they've done the deal, I think that it's a reasonable company to own. A little off topic. I well, not completely off topic, but do you ever get kickback from or, or feedback at all from guys who disagree with your utilization of smog? I, I do actually. I'm mostly on Twitter. Uh, I, I recently joined Twitter. Uh, I, I, I like if you don't follow the, some of the energy fin twit guys. There's some great commentary, and and one of the one of the guests I'd like to get on the show probably in February. Um, so I'm even just going to say it. So if Andy Fastow is listening, I, Andy Fastow was with Enron and, um, obviously through the downturn and, and that's a great story. It's one of the reasons I want to have him on the show, but what he's working on right now is actually a technology that interprets the email sentiment of every employee that a company can put on. So, you know, let's be honest, companies are reading employees emails. So if you don't think that your boss is reading your email or has access to, you should check your premise because they are. But this this is a technology that allows you to uh, uh, look at the sentiment. And so pre and and they used the, their emails actually from Enron and Discovery that showed that a whole bunch of the staff leading into the big event that led to their demise, they were all very nervous about it. And the anxiety level was extraordinarily high because they knew that something was going wrong, but they didn't know how to characterize it. And so 
What I find interesting about Twitter and the reason I'm on Twitter is not because 280 characters, you should never govern a nation through 280 characters or have debates with people over 280 characters. LinkedIn, you're only allowed 1,300 and that's nowhere near enough. But just by seeing the sentiment of everything that people post on Twitter, if you sort of like use it as a thermometer, you can kind of see if generally people are bullish, bearish, how they're feeling about things. So um, that's why that's why I focus on on Twitter. And the Twitter guys don't love the smog, and generally it's because they say that there are reserve revisions coming. That might be the case. What I have to believe, and what I believe because I am, I like to think I'm an optimist, even though I come across pretty cynical most of the time, is that third-party reserve auditors have a job to do. By limiting your inventory to five years, you're not including these 15 years or 20 years that some companies say they have. Um, you're not factoring in improved economics through upspacing, through cost reductions, through mergers, through interest payments, balance sheets. So it's just a very basic relative number. And I don't know of a better way to have insight into how much a company is worth if I don't have this massive analyst team doing declines on every single well. So I get that it's not perfect, but I think relatively speaking, it's the best we have. So that's why I go with it. Going back to M and A, um, you certainly told us where you stand on Callan Carrizo. Just got a curiosity, and we know where you're at with Oxian um, and Adarko. Love Vicky. How would you have felt it had had the deal with Chevron gone through instead? Yeah, I, I mean, and th- this this will go down. I think is one of the most interesting transactions. You know, and, and we can't assess it for two years. If Chevron buys Anadarko, I think people are broadly happy. You know, I think that I think the number was about sixty-five dollars a share. Do I remember that right? I think so. Like seventy-five percent cash, twenty-five percent equity. Is that is that the number, or was it twenty-five? I think it was twenty-five percent cash, seventy-five percent equity, if I recall. But whatever it was, you know, Chevron Chevron wanted the Anadarko asset, so I think that that shows that there is intrinsic value. I think that Chevron, by a lot of metrics, is is considered certainly as one of the better performing majors now. Um, their stock has certainly outperformed. Their their dividend yields four percent. Exxon trades at five. So just as an apples to apples, you would say that Chevron is 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 considered a better performer. And so the fact that they were using so much equity and and they were willing to pay sixty five dollars a share, to me says that that is at least part of what Anadarko's core value is sixty five dollars a share. All right. I think that Chevron would have integrated that merger well. And I think that net net, people would not be so negative towards MA had that deal gone through. And I've talked a lot about Vicky on on uh, Vicky. I, I don't I, I've met her once and you may have seen the selfie I posted that I I gotta give it to her because I just walked up, shook her hand, said I'm a big fan and said, Hey, I'm gonna take a selfie with you. Um, so she's a rock star, in my opinion, and I'll and I'll say why. We don't pay CEOs to generate market returns. We pay CEOs to generate alpha. And so when I think about One Energy, um, what we were doing is we weren't betting on oil. We weren't betting on the market. We were betting on an asset that we chose that we thought was the best. And that was how we were getting our shareholders' returns. And so, you know, obviously Oxy has a lot more data on this, but. They looked at, at Anadarko, and, and they've talked about it at the Intercom conference, and, and Glenn, I know you saw that, that luncheon, but they talked about for two years, they went after Anadarko in every way, shape, or form. So they wanted this company, they wanted this asset, and when Chevron put them in play, Anadarko gives them a call and basically says, hey, you have a couple days to come in with a better offer, which, which is, you know, crazy. And what did Miss Hall do? Well, she flew across to... Uh, Total and sold the the African assets for eight nine billion dollars, which were non core to the transaction uh, and helped finance it. She met with Buffett and put ten billion dollars in place, and she bypassed a shareholder vote. That that there's two things I think that are important about this. Number one, if this deal went to a shareholder vote, even if shareholders had approved it, Anadarko would have rejected their offer, and they already would have been bought by Chevron. So to go to a shareholder vote and win the asset was not possible. And so within the bounds of corporate governance, she went and bypassed the shareholder vote by raising the Buffett equity, by selling the total assets. And she made a call that said, this company is so important to the future of Oxy that I'm willing to take the short-term hit 
for the long-term gain. And Oxy shares, you know, notwithstanding the fact that their debt to EBITDA is quite high now and, and they have a lot of leverage. But if she was willing to do that to bet the company, what do you think she's going to be willing to do to save the company? So I'm not an Oxy shareholder. I am concerned about their debt. But I really believe that that this management team has has made a call. They're, they've sold real estate. They've, they're trying to sell a whole bunch of different assets. I think it's a really interesting, and that's why we pay CEOs to do those deals. So so that's why I like that deal. Time will tell. I, I'm going to give her two years. I will be the most critical of her if this ultimately doesn't work out, and that whole board should be fired, and that whole management team should be fired. But until then, I give them two years to make this work, and then we'll see where they go. And at some point, I will buy Oxy shares when I have more line of sight to their debt repayment. Right now, I just can't. So that's Oxy, that's Chevron. PDC. PDC SRC. I love the PDC SRC deal. Um, and not just because PDC had an activist in it. I think everyone knows Kimmeridge uh, had owned Eris and had sold that asset to PDC, which is how they ended up with so many shares. But PDC had historically been a DJ Basin player. For those of us who live in Colorado, we know how challenging the oil and gas environment is here uh, in terms of regulatory and, and people constantly trying to shut the industry down sort of through backdoor ways. And we will have a guest on to talk a lot more about Colorado and SB 181 and Prop 112 and, and just what the future of Colorado is. But PDC and SRC have a huge adjacent contiguous Colorado position. I think it's fair to say not a lot of new companies are going to want to come in and expose themselves to Colorado risk if they don't already have it. And for PDC, it allows them to cut GNA uh, pretty dramatically with SRC. It allows them to buy it with 100% equity, which means that they can have a stronger balance sheet and they get to free cash flow pretty soon. And so when I look at the PDC SRC deal, that, incidentally, is another company that on the smog basis trades below its net asset value. And so notwithstanding Colorado risk, which I think is just a time risk as opposed to a you can't develop it risk. But again, we'll talk more about that in a future show. I really like that deal. And the PDC SRC deal is the example of the deals that should be done. And I think it's the example of the deals that we're going to see in January and February where these large independents go and buy pure play small companies that need help with their GNA and and asset deployment and cost of capital and we're going to see a lot of roll ups. Um, I think we're going to see the first one next week. If I'm by the time this podcast comes out, merger Monday, I think we're going to see a merger on Monday. Any names you want to submit? You know, I, I am actually. I think that's good. I am going to submit it. Um, I'm not going to say who they're going to buy, but I, I do think Apache. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Apache. Um, hold on, let me pull up my spreadsheet here. Apache, the company that people love to hate, love to hate. So for people who can't see this, David has got this massive spreadsheet and his whole computer set up here that uh, he references. So, <laughs> yeah, this is this is this this is the secret. This is where all my smog work uh, goes and all my company valuations go. Um, we are going to do a demo actually, um, as some companies come out with their with their earnings. We're going to go through and actually help our listeners go through a smog so that they can feel better about the companies they own. But when I look at Apache, so um, Q3 2019, so the numbers are a little bit dated, but just stick with me on this. They have $8.4 billion of debt, and, and that is before they did their big Suriname JV, which I think is, is a really interesting subtext of this conversation. But so $8.4 billion with $377 million of outstanding shares, that means that per share, they have $22.26 of debt. Just as a metric, um, when you look at their, uh, their annualized cash flow, they traded about three times debt to cash flow. Now, again, this is pre Suriname, and this is using Q3 numbers annualized. So, you know, there's a little bit of an ebb to flow, but that, that's a pretty important number. Then I look at the quarterly interest they pay, which is $95 million, which is about 14% of their operating cash flow. And they pay $98 million in GNA, which is also about 14% of their operating cash flow. So 28% of their cash flow every quarter goes to GNA and interest. And again, these numbers aren't meant to be the be all end all, but they are an indicative of how does this company perform relative to other companies. And when I look at their smog, it was $13.7 billion at year end 2018. 
which is important to know because at year-end 2018, oil prices were sort of 62 flat and gas prices were 320 flat. And when we look at the year in 19 smog, it's going to be more like 55 oil flat and 250 gas flat. So there is going to be a price compression on this number. But if you look at $13.7 billion of smog and you net out $8.4 billion of debt, and then you project three years worth of interest in GNA, what I see as their possible share price is about $10 a share. And as of yesterday, they were trading about 25 so that's 250% of their smog. And now I recognize that a lot of things happen in strip pricing versus smog pricing and in development and sales and assets. But as a relative, Apache trades at 250% of their smog and has a high debt. So the Suriname surprise by JVing that with Total really put the shorts who have been betting against this company because they don't believe in the Alpine High, they don't believe in their inventory in the Midland Basin, and they didn't believe in Suriname. The shorts were selling the stock. And so at the time they announced it, I think the stock was about $18. And post Suriname, the JV, because of the, the liquidity that provides and the, the free cash flow that they now don't have to spend on this international development, but they trade at 250%. So if I'm sitting in BD at Apache, and I'm saying, what do I need to do? I need to buy someone that trades sub 250%, which quite frankly, most of the industry trades sub 250%, but very few trade sub 100%. So I'm just saying, if I'm Apache, I'm using my equity to buy a company that trades about 100% of their NAV. I can afford a very substantial premium to put them in there. I can cut interest cost, I can cut G&A cost, and it's a very, very accretive transaction. And then if my shares rise the way they should, I can then issue equity to pay off more debt, assuming the market will give you some opportunity to put 500 million or a billion dollars equity. And then you can crush the shorts even more, and the next thing you know, your stock's up 30 or 40%. So again, none of the things I'm saying are investment advice. I'm just saying structurally, if I'm sitting in Apache BD, that's what I'm doing. So. Well, we're going to find out. You, <laughs> you you made it seem imminent, uh, or at least as far as a speculative guess yeah. on your show. Yeah, I mean, and, and if, if we don't speculate on this show, then then why why are listeners going to tune in? So <laughs> so that's, that's M&A uh, for 2020. I think we're going to see a lot. Let's talk natural gas. I did a post in December talking about natural gas, and, and quite honestly, I continue to be very concerned. I, obviously, you know, natural gas since 2006 – I mean, if, if you remember back to 2004, 5, 6, where, you know, even the Anadarko Kerr McGee deal was done so that Anadarko would become the premier onshore gas player in the U.S. And none of the reasons that Oxy bought Anadarko has anything to do with their gas assets. Even Wattenberg is, you know, that was, that, that was where Anadarko sent employees to die. It was like a third tier asset that had refracts and then re refracts and then trifracts, and it was all vertical. And I remember the first time I was still in Anadarko in 2008 when they drilled the first horizontal well in Wanberg. Is that right? Yeah. might not have been the first, but it was yeah. certainly their first. And, and from that point on, Wattenberg was the, dro- the growth engine for Anadarko, right. which is crazy. But on natural gas, I am, I am very concerned. And the reason is threefold. It's called Haynesville, it's called Marcellus, and it's called Permian Associated Gas. So... Um, la- I'd, I'd drive you to the website and, and I'd have you look at the, the posts because I think that we can do a little bit better when you have graphs and, and really understand it. But it's called natural gas burnout. And, and the general concept is that the Haynesville, notwithstanding the fact that it isn't a huge play in terms of the total number of BCF a day, we produce about 110 BCF a day in the country. Mm-hmm. Haynesville produces around about 10, 10, 11 BCF. But well performance has been improving so much in 2016, 17, and 18 versus the prior t- years, 15, 14, 13, 12, that the EURs are up, productivity is up per foot. And so economics have actually come down. And so that's why you continue to see, I think we see 50 rigs in the Marse- or in the Haynesville, which I still can't understand. And, and maybe we'll get Jerry Jones on the show at some point to talk about the Comstock um, acquisitions of, of Haynesville gas. Uh, but but when you have something that can grow that much and continues to outperform historical type curves, 
that's that's problem number one. Problem number two, the Marcellus has grown really from two BCF to about 30 BCF a day over the last 10 years and um, has happened very, very quickly. And so even though we're not seeing the same productivity increases, the size of the resource in the, the Marcellus, I mean, have you have you been out over to the east and, and toured that field? Mm-mm. It's 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 crazy, you know. Notwithstanding water and and but you're closest to the largest market in the U.S. Um, it, it's just it's just immense. So that's a problem. And then the third problem, which is now not only is it a problem for our industry, but it's a problem for the optics of our industry, is Permian associated gas. And there was an article out today, we'll put it in the show notes, um, that talked about the amount of gas that was flared uh, in 2018 versus 2017. And I mean, it is, it is, we are flaring a substantial amount of gas. Right. And in spite of the fact that, you know, hundreds of millions a day of natural gas are being burned, we still have a differential in the Permian that's like a dollar and access to markets is limited. And Every time you produce a barrel of oil, which you want to, you're producing three or four MCF a day of gas, which you don't want to, and that gas has to go somewhere. And when you have those three plays growing so much gas, I just don't see an environment where gas trades up above 250 or 225 in the next year or two. Um, and, and as an investor, I don't know how you buy companies that own natural gas, which we are teeing up a, a guest coming up in this month that does have a very different thesis on natural gas. So tune in for that. We'll, uh, we'll announce it on LinkedIn. Do you see uh, sub $2? I, I do. I mean, certainly in the shoulder seasons in April, I think we can be back into the kind of $1.50. And, oh, and, wow. and when, I was in, when I was in Anadarko in 2006, I remember gas was the differentials to the Rockies was so big that we were actually shutting in gas wells. And I think we're going to see a big round similar to what Apache did when they shut in about 200 million a day this year uh, at the Alpine High. I think we're going to see a lot of natural gas shut-ins in March, April, May, June because the cheapest way to store gas is to store it in its own reservoir. And I'm just not convinced that by shutting in a well, you're doing that much damage. And since shareholders want positive cash, why would you burn cash to produce gas when you can just sit it in the reservoir for six more months? And then bring it on. If you want to survive, that to me is is where. So, uh, prediction number two, I'm pretty concerned about natural gas. What about uh, switching? Can we switch gears to, to oil? Or yeah, you know, you know, this is my favorite topic. Yeah, just... This is my favorite topic. So, I, I've written about this. There was a series in September uh, called Peak Oil USA, and there's a couple things we need to talk about when when I say peak oil. A lot of people remind me that you know peak oil has been called before, and and some people talk about how. Uh, so when you talk about the flack that I get sometimes, I think peak oil is misunderstood, and so I will acknowledge, in a price environment where let's say oil is three hundred dollars a barrel, does the U.S. probably grow production again? Yes. However, I believe that. Oil is going to be range bound between, let's say, a low of 50, which is kind of the marginal cost in my view, and a high of, let's say, 65 or 70 as sort of the range. And I think that we're going to see that in the next five to 10 years. And so, so to talk peak oil production in the US, I think we have to make a couple of assumptions. Number one on the supply side. So, Saudi Arabia. And, and you may have seen me when I went on Bloomberg and talked a little bit about Saudi Arabia. Saudi Aramco is a very interesting company. Uh, they produce around 10 million barrels a day and their reserve life index. So if you take the total reserves divided by their annual production, they have a 53 year reserve life index. Now, the large international oil companies, sort of the Exxons and the Chevrons, etc., their average reserve life index is around 17 And so the reason I say this is because if Saudi Aramco was a pure for-profit company that didn't have any of the social pressures of funding that entire economy, you would say that they could triple their production to get a appropriate sized reserve life index, and that would be where they should be producing. So if that were the case, Saudi Aramco would be producing 30 million barrels a day, which in that case, I mean, oil would be zero. (laughs) Everyone would go bankrupt. And so there's a huge piece on the supply side. Because Saudi Aramco has a 53-year reserve life index, produces 10 million barrels a day, that the money they generate 
feeds the the economy and the social structure of that entire country. To me, 2014 aside, you're always going to have little blips, but they are going to defend prices that allow them to pay dividends to their investors. They just had the world's largest IPO and got the largest valuation. So that's a big that's a big win for Saudi Arabia. I think it's overvalued just in terms of a conventional dividend yield. But I mean, if you want to own a company, Saudi Aramco is the last one that's going to turn the lights out for the oil industry. And, uh, you know, so so I don't worry as much about supply. And then on the demand side, you know, again, have we hit peak demand? The planet is 7.4 billion. And I've seen projections that say the planet's going to have 9 billion people by 2050. And we live... You know, I have two cars. I have three cars. Uh, one is in one is in Arizona, and it's uh, the the minivan that you may have seen, greatest car ever. But like the way that we live in North America, with access to cheap fuel, cheap natural gas, cheap heating, we're not exposed to the same level of energy poverty. Where there's two billion people in the world, where the sun goes down and lights, and they lose access to right. productivity because they have no lights, and they burn wood or dung inside, and, and the, the environmental impact, both to the environment but to their lungs and the health issues that are caused by burning wood inside of a house. The, our, our world has never gone to a less dense energy supply. And so you know, when you look at the number of acres that solar panel and wind and turbines, when you look at how big those things have to be to generate electricity, which, by the way, are the power for your electric vehicles. I just don't see the same level of concern on demand growth, certainly in the next five to 10 years. And for all intents and purposes, the US energy industry has five to 10 years of really good drilling development left before we go back into the same decline we were on after Hubbard's peak oil. So again, I had to talk about supply and world demand in order to get to peak US supply. Yeah. Is that, is that fair? Fair enough. So, you know, I, I started noticing this going back to like 2000, February, March. But every year in the U.S. going back to 2014, um, after the fall, we've drilled more wells than we had the previous year. We've drilled longer laterals by a substantial portion than we did the previous year. We've hit higher IPs without the commensurate increase in the estimated ultimate recovery. And so if you just, you know, in your mind, visualize a higher IP going to the same point, even if we didn't have parent child issues, you have higher decline rates. And so the wells that are coming on are declining at a higher rate than they've ever declined. Plus, we're drilling so closely now that they're interfering with other wells that is causing the decline rate to be even steeper. And then you add to that the financial discipline because of the, the crisis of balance sheets, and you end up with a scenario where, and my projection uh, for next year, I posted it on LinkedIn, pardon me, LinkedIn, um, was 11,300 wells is what I project will be drilled next year using the run rate of November, which would be down 16% from 2019. Okay. And I'm also projecting that completions will be about 14,200 which is running the October run rate, and that is about up 3%. And you may ask, how do we drill less wells and complete more wells? And that's this infamous concept of ducks, which is, is so important to peak oil because there's a lot of debates around what is the EIA duck count and what does it mean? And right now we're sitting at about 7,000 ducks in the oil basins. The oil basins would be Bakken, Eagleford, Niobrara, Anadarko, Permian. About 7,000. And we're completing about 1,000 wells a month in those basins. So the inventory is about 6.8, 6.5 6 in terms of our ability to complete these wells. Because that duck count, whether you believe it's 5,000, 6,000, or 7,000, and because we're drilling roughly 900 wells a month and we're only completing 1,000 wells a month, it will take years to get through the workable duck inventory. And so since you've already spent the money on drilling, you might as well complete the well. And those are your best economics. The best way for companies to pay down debt is to continue to restrict their drilling. So I think that we're going to see another 80 rigs come out next year. So right now we're about 700 horizontal rigs. Right. I think that by June, maybe June, July, we'll be at 620 horizontal rigs running. 
I think will maintain the completion pace that we ran in kind of the October time frame, which was down about 15% from where it had been for the rest of the year. But I think we will continue to run an elevated completion pace and that by the end of next year, we'll have worked off around 3,000 ducks. And that way, we're going to moderate the decline relative to if it was just an apples to apples decline of drilling versus completions. But I don't believe that the U.S. can grow from where uh, November production is likely, which is about 12.8 million barrels a day. And so I would say by the end of next year, we're going to be in the 12.5 to 12.6 million barrels a day in the U.S. So that's about down 200,000 barrels a day peak to or you know entry to exit. And the market expects you know 500 or 600,000 barrels a day of growth from the U.S. So to me, that sets up at the very least a stable price environment if Saudi Arabia plays ball and there's no reason that they shouldn't. And therefore, all that extra cash flow can be used for companies to pay down debt, which means by the end of 2020, balance sheets on the whole are much stronger. And the M&A that's happened has made companies stronger. So I feel like by the end of 2020, the industry is going to be in a much, much better place. Question for you. Uh, what, and you may not have much concern at all, but do you see you know, Russia at all uh, uh, impacting that, that outlook at all? Or is it just sort of they're, you know, they're going to overproduce sometimes and other times they're not going to? Or any thoughts on that? Or does it matter? I mean, it, it obviously matters because I think Russia right now is number three producer in the world. Um, and clearly they have the capacity and the desire to continue to grow. And we'll, we'll spend more time on this, but, but there had been some rhetoric around, uh, that Putin had come out and talked about how U.S. fracking was so negative. But, I mean, talk about talking your own book. When you look at the amount of natural gas that's provided out of Russia to Europe and the prices that they sell that at, of course they want fracking to go away. If I was, if I was trying to impact the U.S. and trying to make my energy worth more, I too would call fracking the worst thing in the world because 67% of the natural gas wells in the United States have to be fracked to produce anything. Uh, and of the shale wells, it's, I mean, every of the basins I talked about, every one of those needs to be fracked for us to produce oil. And so the best way for Russia to, and for the world to see higher energy prices is to outlaw fracking. So of course, if there's, if you believe in this sort of conspiracy theory that there's a lot of bots uh, going on Facebook and Twitter and, and, and pushing things, there is no better energy policy for the rest of the world than to make fracking banned, um, which does, to answer your question of, do I worry about the Russia? Yeah. On, on the margin, could they overproduce a couple hundred thousand barrels a day? Yes. Could the Iranians end up having a deal? I think we have three million barrels or two million barrels a day off the market because the Iranians have sanctions from the U.S. If all those barrels came back to market tomorrow, do we see a depression in oil prices? Yes. But fundamentally, these countries need 60 or $65 as sort of a social hedge for their GDP and for their economies. So I think that they ultimately defend it. And because we've seen the heyday of, of shale and now we're in the decline, again, and I'm saying for the U.S., I'm not saying for individual companies. There are some companies who will grow. But on the, on the margin, U.S. production will decline. And all the rest of the countries of the world can kind of sit back for the next three and four years and realize that the U.S. is not energy independent, that the U.S. is going to need to increase the amount of imports and cut the amount of exports because we just don't have that much oil left. Which tees up our final topic for today, which is 2020. And, and I think it kind of, uh, and the election in particular. And it tees up sort of what this podcast is going to be um, and what the hot take of the day has been. You know, we can criticize our industry in the last 10 years for maybe not being as forward thinking about some of the things that we could have done to get ahead of some of these setback rules, climate change discussions, you know, is flaring good, is flaring not, uh, what North Dakota has done in terms of limiting flaring, um, the discussions are in front of the Texas Railroad Commission in terms of what they should do. But at the end of the day, our industry is identified as big, bad oil and gas with these big, bad companies, and they're faceless and nameless, and they're run by CEOs that cannot criticize publicly without risking their share price and, quite honestly, their, their, their board seats and, and their entire career. And for good or for bad, um, 
I have started to become a little bit of the face or a face for the industry because I can say whatever I want and it's not going to impact anybody's share price. Uh, it's certainly not going to impact my employability because I'm as employable as I ever was or not as employable as I ever was because this is just how I am. And so as I think about 2020 and fracking discussions and setback discussions and climate change and, and having that conversation, we need faces. We need the faces of the industry. We need faces of our friends to be out there correcting people that it is not the oil and gas companies who are creating as many emissions as it is the people who are driving cars the people who are flying, the people who are having more than one kid, the people who have dogs, the people who eat livestock. All of these elements of our economy add to the carbon footprint of our economy. And we at the base produce a commodity which is burned for transportation, for electricity, for energy, for the world to use. So if we want to talk about climate change and the impact of fossil fuels, let's talk about energy consumption Let's talk about energy efficiency and let's move away from oil and gas is bad, solar and wind is good, to here is the energy we need in our country to maintain the standard of living and how are we going to fill that in? Absolutely. What are the opportunities they're in, right? 100%. You know, uh, you know is, is it, it's not a zero sum game, but you know, where you take away from coal and you add it as natural gas. Yeah, there's opportunities there. Right. And and from from the climate change, again, if, if we want to talk about environmental activists who are listening to this, because I know we would just have a ton of guys who are really interested to learn about energy and learn more of the facts. So I, I'm sure our audience has a ton of, of environmentalists listening in on this. Right, Glenn? Maybe maybe, so. maybe one, maybe Robert. <laughs> um, but 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 it, but in all seriousness, like, let's not go for the absolute degrowth less dense energy solution, let's target things that can be done and make sense to do. Flaring is something that we should address as an industry. Reducing flaring en masse and even being the leaders of advocating to shut down flaring is going to have a huge impact on the environmental footprint. Methane has something like 80 times the CO2 or the, the greenhouse gas impact that CO2 does. But the thing about methane is its half-life is nine years. So once it's released in the atmosphere, after nine years, it breaks apart. And so if we can reduce venting and flaring, even though flaring is, reducing CO, is producing CO2 because it's burned, but if we can reduce venting, we can reduce methane. And if we reduce methane, we have a massive impact. And our industry can lead that by choice. So those are the types of incremental decisions I want to see companies starting to advocate. And, and I'll use Oxy as an example. They advocate a lot of CO2 capture, um, a lot on their flaring. So when we talk about ESG and the good things about ESG, those are the good on the ESG. Uh, the bad is, you know, look, we have this great diverse board that is, is awesome and, and they're, they've stewarded an 80% drop in, in equity price and, and they're all still employed as board members. Um, that would be the bad part of ESG. So, but anyway, so that's, that's 2020. I think that the election is obviously going to have a huge, huge impact on our industry. I think we need to continue to have these discussions and that's, that's what this podcast is for. So looking ahead to what you can expect, we will have specials with uh, you know roughly an hour, sort of similar to today, where we will have guests. It will not just be me droning on. Um, and, uh, and hopefully we can get insight into some of these major issues like climate change, like natural gas, like the move to solar, like some of these acquisitions, um, and a lot of the, the key topics and do a deep dive. We're also going to have sort of a segment called Hot Take Your Commute, which will be recorded on Saturdays or Sundays and released hopefully Sunday nights so that it's about 10 or 15 minutes. You can listen to it on your way into work and we'll go over the hot takes of the previous week and and interesting news articles and interesting things that impact our our industry just in a, in a couple minute snip so that you're able to stay on top of it, get to the water cooler and sound just a little bit smarter. So um, we're excited that the show is going to kind of go. If you have feedback, uh, you can email me at drw at hottakeoftheday.com. Please visit our website, comment on all the historical posts, uh, subscribe to our email services. And if you want to know how I became like this, uh, check out my book, What the Fuck is Wrong with Everybody Else? What They Didn't Teach You in Business School. That's up on Amazon right now. Um, Glenn, 
Thanks. This was uh, podcast number one. Very excited about how it went. And uh, anything you want to add for, for the listeners? No, thank you, David. That was excellent. All right, let's uh, let's go out with my new favorite song. <laughs>